Good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this Jog Live, which is going to focus on fieldwork uh, in preparation for the National Festival of Fieldwork, which is coming up in June 2024. Um, this is a bit of an experiment for the Jog Live team. We're actually pre-recording today's session, so there won't, as usual, be an opportunity to enter into the chat, but we'd be really ha happy to hear any field feedback from you. Uh, once you've had the opportunity to see what we uh, put together for you today. Um, so all the usual reminders, uh, we're recording this, but it's only ourselves today, only the Jog Live team. Uh, the chat isn't operating today, but do send us some, some uh, feedback if you'd like to, and do tweet us on our, our Twitter handle. Uh, can I just remind you, moving on to the next slide, that these ideas uh, are all being shared by our contributors who are members of the Geographical Association, and the Early Years and Primary Committee. And we are very happy to share our ideas with you. Um, but what we would like to ask you to do is if you use any of our materials that you would uh, acknowledge their source individually and collectively. Uh, so that is with each individual, but also um, for the GA and EYPPC. Um, and we are retaining our own copyright. Thank you, Anthony. So uh, for this first, um, pre-recorded Jog Live. We're going to start with me talking about uh, the National Festival of Fieldwork. There are some slides on the GA website that you can download to support yourself with that. And then we're moving on to two inputs. First of all, we've got Kate Glanville. She's a member of the Jog Live team, and she's going to be talking about using sensory approaches in fieldwork. And then we have Steve Rawlinson, another member of the Jog Live team, who is going to be uh, introducing eight ways of thinking. Um, we also have, of course, uh, Tess, who is going to talk about um, the current edition of Primary Geography, which is, as usual, full of wonderful things. So I'll hand over to you, Tess, uh, and then uh, you can tell us all about this current edition, which is a particularly brilliant one, I have to say. Thank you very much, Julia, and uh, thanks to everyone today. Um, really delighted to have another opportunity to talk to you about this, just as Julia said, wonderful edition um, of Primary Geography. It's our current one um, and it's on kind geographies. But just for a few more weeks, because we're in anticipation of our next issue, which is coming out very, very soon, uh, which will be on the curriculum with our guest editor, Paula Owens. Please don't miss it. It will be invaluable uh, for curriculum concepts, planning and curriculum making. So I hope that many of you will have already been enjoying and benefiting from the wonderful edition that is Kind Geographies, uh, a very timely edition, I feel. Um, and just a reminder very quickly about some of the gems that are inside the cover, which itself has lots of inspiring ideas as a downloadable resource. So Sharon Witt, who is the editor for this uh, edition, has done a superlative job of bringing together some really inspiring and important articles from a wide and diverse range of educators on a very eclectic collection of different issues with, the under, with this underlying theme of kindness and care. So these include, and you can see them here, we've got some random ideas of geographical kindness, which we can all do at all times and encourage our, um, our children to be doing. We've got Geography from the Ground Up, which is a lovely article about um, our youngest members of the, of the primary geography um, community, uh, babies. So it's the first thing we think that there is on babies geography or baby geographies. We've also got a wonderful article um, on personal stories about significant places. And this is Ben Ballin, who is one of our, uh, on our primary uh, editorial board for the Primary Geography Journal, uh, in conversation with Michael Rosen, talking about a really fascinating project which blends literacy and geography with personal and family histories. So lots in there that can be used uh, in the classroom. And it's wonderful, really, uh, sensitive and moving um, conversation there. We've got a really important article on if racism vanished for a day and the impact of racism that there is on the mental health of our young children. We have an article on stories that we can tell through local inquiries, so doing stories and what that can tell us about our local area. 
a wonderful article on relational geography, bringing in some crows and kinship. And I will leave that to you to read uh, for your imagination. Um, an important article as well on Ukrainian refugees and the bringing of our different worlds together, very much similarities uh, that are looked at there as well. An article on animated geographies and the liveliness of all geographical uh, entities. And then a powerful and empowering uh, interview with the artist Paul Harfleet, um, who is exploring kindness and difference with nature. So all of this is available online, with along with a wealth of, of additional resources, which I know you'll find really useful and inspiring. And we always, as ever, uh, welcome feedback on this. So please do let us know. And don't forget that next issue, uh, which will be on the curriculum, will be out in a few weeks. Please don't miss that one. OK, and uh, thank you, Anthony, just for some resources uh, that we've got on the GA site. If you can, that's lovely. Um, so lots and lots of stuff with our focus today on fieldwork. Um, and supporting the National Festival of Fieldwork. We've got four um, editions of In the Know. We've got in Introducing Fieldwork Inquiries. We've got two on fieldwork equipment and data collection techniques, one for physical and one for human geography. And then we've got another uh, issue for fieldwork data presentation and analysis. So covering a really wide range here. We've got the wonderful Everyday Guide to Primary Geography Local Fieldwork. I cannot recommend that enough. Um, we have also um, a resource on investigating rivers and the very important uh, aspect of progression and how we look for progression in fieldwork experiences. Lots and lots of resources and ideas and inspiration in leading primary geography, the handbook for um, all primary teachers. So there are lots of things it's interspersed throughout um, that handbook. And then, of course, we've got lots more ideas on the website. As, as uh, Julia mentioned, we've got a whole area dedicated to field work on the GA website. So please do have a look at that uh, as well as the shop where you can buy these resources. So I think um, we're going to get lots more ideas and, and inspiring innovations as we go through. So, Anthony, I think that's it from me. Thank you. Sorry, wasn't unmuted then. Thank you all very much indeed, Tess, for all the work that you and the rest of the uh, board do on bringing us primary geography at every term. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. OK, uh, I'm now going to speak about the National Festival of Fieldwork. Uh, some of you may know that this will be the third year that we've had a big focus on fieldwork in the summer for the GA. And this year we're having the whole of the month of June. We started off with a week, found that wasn't long enough. We moved to a fortnight last year and now we've decided to go for a full month of June. Uh, and uh, it's been renamed the National Festival of Fieldwork to encourage everybody to join in um, and do whatever field work they can do in their local area uh, or further afield if they have the opportunity at uh, some time during that month of June. So if you could move on, Jan Anthony, that would be great. Thank you. So um, we, we know uh, from the Ofsted report and also from our experiences during COVID that uh, field work has become more difficult to organise in schools. It can be expensive. It can be difficult to organise. And of course, during COVID, it was really problematic uh, to get anybody together to do anything. Uh, that's why the National Festival of Fieldwork was created. And in its third year, we now have a dedicated section on the GA website. You do not have to be a member of the Geographical Association to access all the resources there. They're free to absolutely everybody. Please, please do go and look at them. Uh, more, more resources are being uh, loaded up there all the time. Um, so anybody can use the, the materials that are there. There are lots of ideas and practical activities and resources. And there are beautiful certificates you can download for your school and for individual pupils to show they've taken part in the Festival of Fieldwork. And of course, you can also showcase the opportunity um, that you in your using social media, you can tell other people that you've been involved in using uh, the materials that we present and in uh, doing some field work. Thank you, Anthony. So, uh, as with all field work, uh, field, uh, any geographical field work needs to be Im embedded in a proper inquiry with a real question and a real answer that can be established. 
And of course, there are lots of different skills that children will develop while they're uh, engaging in their fieldwork led inquiry. Uh, key, absolutely key fieldwork skill of observation, but also different techniques for recording, such as using photography or sketching or counting, uh, developing an inquiring mind, analyzing their findings, however they've recorded them, and also thinking hard about what they found out, what they've learned from it, engaging their creativity and imagination. And of course, the really important thing about fieldwork is it involves doing geography, and we all know that active learning like that uh, lays down memories and that's how children really learn um, what the content that we want them to learn. So lots and lots of opportunities um, to for children to really develop their geographical knowledge and understanding through fieldwork activities in your local area uh, and school grounds and possibly uh, beyond. Uh, and Kate, I know, is going to talk in a moment about uh, using all the senses. So, of course, there's lots of possibilities for organising fieldwork. It could be single lesson taking place outside uh, your classroom in the school grounds, or possibly you can arrange something a little bit further away to take a little bit longer. There are various different ways you can organise your fieldwork, including, of course, uh, setting a homework task for pupils to collect some information and then bring it back to school where you can all analyse it together. Thanks, Anthony. Um, and of course, absolutely everywhere has potential to be discovered. Uh, many of us find that we're asked, um, well, I live on a, I work on a, a very unexciting housing estate. Uh, there isn't really anything there. What fieldwork can we do? And um, we all believe there's plenty of opportunity for really meaningful fieldwork uh, in absolutely every environment. So there's a good example there of how do people personalize their houses. Um, but uh, there are other resources on the website in the dedicated National Festival of Fieldwork section uh, where you can find lots of other opportunities and things that you could uh, explore and investigate uh, on any housing estate. Thanks, Anthony. And then, of course, uh, there are lots and lots of different approaches that you can take all over the place. So what is it that is really valued, worthy of preservation and conservation in the local area? What about pollution and the effect it has on people? Uh, what about the overall effect the environment has on people? Um, we know that uh, people respond differently to different environments and exploring that uh, with children is really interesting. Um, some children prefer quiet, more peaceful environments. Others, of course, like really exciting environments. And of course, there's always possibilities uh, to think about the people in the environment. What sort of jobs might people do locally? Uh, how do people manage crossing the road? What sort of transport provision is there, et cetera? So many ideas for excellent field work led inquiries to be done anywhere. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, here's some more ideas, uh, very simple ideas here. Just choose three words to describe your environment. Play I spy. Uh, look for different sorts of rocks. All of these, there are uh, worked examples of all of these on the GA website. Uh, and then the sort of uh, steeplechase idea of uh, going out and hunting for different things. Thanks, Anthony. So uh, included on the website uh, is some um, support for working with your colleagues to help them develop uh, their fieldwork. Some of your colleagues might be a little bit unconfident with fieldwork. We know that's one of the reasons uh, teachers give for not doing perhaps as much as they might do. Um, so uh, there's guidance on the website with all of these areas of how you might support your colleagues um, to feel more confident to embark on a little bit of fieldwork. And Tess has just um, put in the, um, Tess has just put in the, um, in the chat that there is um, a dedicated part of the website and there it is. Okay, so if you go to the Geographic Association website, you'll be able to see that we have a dedicated part of the website, which uh, is free to all to use. Okay, so uh, I'm now going to hand over to Kate, who is going to talk about sensory um, approaches to fieldwork. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Julia. Uh, so, yeah, as, as Julia said, we're looking at using uh, multi-sensory approaches to supporting fieldwork across uh, a range of locations. Uh, can you, next slide, please, Anthony. Uh, so if we start thinking about 
talking about a new place, if we look at um, introducing new places to children, if we ask them to describe it, what they would tend to do is focus on what they can see. Um, and that's not really getting the full impression of what that place is like. Yes, if we're seeing what the place is visually like, but we're not seeing all of those other important aspects that make up that site. So we're not noting what it sounds like or what it smells like. We're not noticing uh, where the warm areas are, where the shade is. So what we would like to do, what we would uh, aim for children to have the understanding of is that fuller range of that location by using more of their senses. So try and encourage them to use more senses when they're investigating location. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. Uh, so that is an idea called sensology. Uh, this is a, a description of sensology I found on a school website. I don't know the school, I just thought the uh, explanation was, was quite well, well put together. So it's looking at all of the senses, getting children to make use of all of their different senses, as well as their sensory systems. So really incorporating all of the, the different aspects of the senses in order to investigate. And it isn't just for field work. It can be used in, in any approach at all. But today, what we're looking at in particular is how it can be used in, in particular for field work. OK, next slide, please. Anthony. So in terms of why, why it, it is a useful approach, if we think of uh, a range of different children in the class, we're going to have children who have different additional needs. At the start, I said most children would be looking at seeing something if they were describing it. But if we have children who have visual impairment, we need to think about how those children are going to access something if most of our fieldwork tasks are related to sight. Uh, similarly, if we start using a hearing task and we have children who are hearing impaired, then how are they going to access that? Uh, and children who have physical challenges or are hypersensitive to certain sensory experiences. If we have that range of different sensory approaches, we can ensure that all children are able to access some aspects, as well as making sure that the whole range of uh, the place is, is being understood as well. So if we look at the national curriculum for Key Stage 1, it's saying that children will be using aerial photographs and, and looking at landmarks and human and physical approaches. So we're thinking that's probably looking at visual aspects. They're using those aerial photographs, so we have to use that. But then it goes on uh, for Key Stage 1 to say that that uh, will be using fieldwork and observational skills. It doesn't really say what those observational skills have to be. So it's not saying it has to be done in a certain way. In key stage two, again, it's saying that we're using observational skills and we're going to measure and record human and physical features. But again, it's not saying that this has to be done in a certain way. So we can use it in a multi-sensory approach. And if we look at what Ofsted have said in their Getting Our Bearings report, like Julia mentioned earlier, uh, fieldwork is something that we need to develop and we can start looking at um, how we can use those geographical skills and which geographical skills we need to develop. And multisensory approaches are a way that we can do that. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. So there are lots of different uh, approaches that we can use for lots of different, for all of the senses. Um, so I work in ITT and some of, I've got put, some of these approaches that I've put on the next few slides I've used with uh, my trainee teachers as well. So I'll, I'll mention how they got on with those as we go through them. Uh, and these can be used in any location. So it can be used in, in the school grounds, in the local area, further afield, wherever your fieldwork is. But as we've said, fieldwork doesn't have to take place in a certain location. It can take place at any point that you can get to. Uh, next slide, please, Anthony. So as you can see, I've put each slide um, related to a different sense. So the first one, looking at touch, um, obviously there's like texture rubbings that we can do. So things like brass rubbings that we've all, I'm sure, done at the past. But moving on from those rubbings, uh, different approaches as well. So we could use um, something like plasticine or modeling clay to press into different textures and seeing which textures that we can find in our local area and comparing those. If you use the modeling clay, it hardens. So you've got that permanent reminder of what 
up what uh, textures you can find. Or you could do one in advance and then take it to the children's seed deck and match it up and find where that, set, that where texture was found. Or a tactile map, so children are drawing out whether they think it's a sharp texture or a smooth texture, and they try and combine that and draw the representation of that. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, some areas that might be particularly warm or shaded or windy, and that aspect around touch as well, how the environment is touching them, so how they feel when they're in a certain place. There are lots of different approaches for touch. Okay, next one, please. Thank you. Um, so smell, uh, we could have scent maps and notice all the different smells that we can find in an area. Um, is it one smell? Is it a combination of smells? What happens when they meet? Um, can we follow a smell? If we know, notice a smell, can we actually follow that to its source? And is it actually what we thought it might be? Or are we interested in to find that actually it was something completely different? We thought it was something, but maybe it's an artificial re representation of, of what we thought it was. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so for hearing, um, so sound maps, we could have, and this is one I have done with my students, uh, have a position in, mark a, a dot in the middle of your paper and then notice sounds around you. So pointing in certain directions and saying, I can hear a car that way and it's a long way away. So you draw a longer line, but it's quite quiet. So it's a thinner line. And the closer it is, the shorter the line and the louder it is, the wider the line and noticing what sounds you hear. And it's interesting to do that with your eyes open and then with your eyes closed. And that's what I ask my, my students to do, because I don't think they're aware of how much more they notice with their eyes closed until they close their eyes. And we've done that in the classroom as well as outside. And they start noticing those really small sounds when they close their eyes. So I, getting children to really focus in on those details. Uh, and then also another idea for hearing would be noticing the sounds that you hear in particular. And are they more human sounds or physical sounds? And what is the dominating effect in that area? So is it more a human area or a physical area? What's really dominating the soundscape there? Next slide, please, Anthony. OK, and sight. Uh, so colour swatches, so some people might use uh, paint swatches or colour blocks and finding things in the area that matches those colours. Um, is there anything that matches an unusual colour? If you have paint swatches, you can have different hues of different colours and seeing if you can find different shades of yellows or greens. And is it spot on or is it slightly different? With the paints as well, sometimes they call themselves unusual things like apple green. So does it actually, is it the colour of an apple? Is it, is it just the colour that uh, the paint company have decided that's what it's going to be called? And are those items that you do find natural or man-made? So where do we tend to find more of these colours? And what colours tend to be more natural or tend to be man-made? Uh, another one that we've done with uh, my students, uh, sitting back to back and drawing what they can see, or what their partner can see, um, through description so one child will look at the scene and describe it for the person who's sitting with their back to them uh, and they really don't notice how much detail there is in a scene until they're trying to describe it and we've we've gone through examples of well you said there are three windows so I drew three windows in the building but I drew them horizontally uh, and they were vertical so all those small details that we might not really notice because we just walk past these buildings all the time and we don't really notice what's going on with them and, and really pointing those out. Uh, and then the framing, the view. So cutting a shape out of a piece of card and holding it up and just seeing what's actually within that, within that space that's being cut out. Uh, what difference does that make to what you're seeing? How does that change what your impression of that area is because you can't see what context it's in so how does that make children feel about the different areas okay anthony again our final one of, of taste um clearly we'd have to do some research before we could get children go around and eating different things and making sure that there were no allergies or anything like that um 
but what food could we find in our local area? Is it something that we might have tried before? Is it something that's completely different? Do, is there an opportunity to try things there and then, or is it something we'd have to take back into the class? Um, and how does the food represent that area? Did it line up to what we found on the scent map? So we could smell uh, a certain food when we were looking at our scent map and we followed it and it turned out to be something different. Or, yeah, we were right and it was a certain restaurant or a certain shop that was selling different foods. So how well did that actually represent it? And then when we're thinking about growing foods, so do we have a school garden and who decides what grows there? Is there any food growing there or is it all plants, um, flowers? Uh, and are there any allotments in our local area? And who eats that food? What happens to that food? So finding out about what's going on in the local area in terms of not only field work, but also uh, land use and resources that we can find in the local area as well. It ties into different aspects of the curriculum. OK, thank you, Anthony. And just to finish off, there are lots and lots of different ideas. The top one is the school where I found the Sensology uh, explanation. There are lots of different ideas all of those different books, which you can find in lots of different places. OK, and I'll pass back to Julia then. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. Lots and lots of great ideas there for exploring using all our senses. I can see people uh, rushing out and trying those in their school grounds almost immediately, some of them. Some great ideas. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I'm going to hand over to Steve. Steve is going to speak to us about a fabulous technique called eight-way thinking. And if you're not familiar with eight-way thinking, uh, prepare to uh, expand your thinking about how we might uh, perceive places. Over to you, Steve. Thank you, Julia. Um, it's great to follow on from Kate because a lot of what I'm gonna say um, picks up on what she's done and just extends it a little bit further. But the basic idea about eight-way thinking is that it's a framework by which you can compare different places um, based largely around the senses, but also involving other thoughts, other ideas um, that you might want to take on board. So if you keep on pressing, please, Anthony, for a moment. It was devised by Ian Gilbert as a multidimensional snapshot of people, places, history, sites and sounds and nature of locations on a voyage around Britain. Basically, what he was trying to do was trying to say, well, OK, I've been to this place. What do I record here? How can I compare that with another place? How does this place differ from that place? So it, it enables you to look in your local area and perhaps go to three or four different sites and look and see what's different about them. You might go to a different monuments within your local area and see what's different about those. It's really based on a thinking skills project, which encourages you to think, reflect, and then look more closely. If you can carry on, please, Anthony. So it engages the learner with the eight intelligences we all possess, but we all have them in different preferences and strengths. So if we go to the next slide, next please, please, Anthony. So it's a framework that you can look at the world with, and it's either the real world, because you could do this via field work, which is why we're doing it today, or it could be done as the, through the virtual world via the media. You could do a lot of this and use the same framework, framework via the media. But the key thing is it asks questions, Hopefully it arouses and harnesses curiosity. It enables you to see perhaps the same place with new eyes and it develops empathy with the views of others. That's one of the key things I think this does. Because you share your results, it means that you actually get to understand what other people are seeing from the same place, what they are getting out of the same view. And perception of a place or an issue develops your personal awareness because it engages those senses. OK, Anthony, please, if you could go to the next slide. OK, um, so how does it work? Well, basically, you can have a little chart like the one on the left hand side where you've got the eight senses that we're going to deal with today, eight sort of attributes, eight ways of thinking about a place using perhaps words, feelings, actions, sounds, numbers, sights nature and people and you can see the relationship between this and what Kate was talking about a few moments ago this is just another way of trying to engage children's senses with their environment 
And if you take an example, and what you can do is you can put up to three attributes, perhaps three words about this particular place, three feelings you might have got about this place, three actions that you might want to take as a result of coming to this place, or three things you think they could do to improve this place. What three sounds do you hear? What numbers are involved in being in this place? Or does this place attract lots of people? All sorts of things can come into numbers, as we'll talk about in a moment. What the sites can you see here? How has nature developed in this place? And, 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 the, and the whole idea of people uh, at this particular location. What are they engaged in? What are they doing? So if we take a very simple example. Suppose you took the children to see the Angel of the North. How would you do an eight-way thinking on this particular site? Well, if we just take the idea of the sites, what can you see from this location? So you're standing there underneath the angel. What can you see? So you could record two or three things that you could see. It was lovely when I took some children up there that one of them said, I wonder what the angel could see. And then we had a whole discussion about how high the uh, angel was and how that increased the view that the angel had over what we could see. There's a whole series of art that you can develop within that because you could start to talk about the design of the angel. The angel has got a wingspan, the equivalent of a jumbo jet. Is that too wide? Are an angel's wings too wide? Is that, you know, what, what's the feeling about the representation of an angel that you can get from that? So just using sight brings up a whole range of things. People. Who comes to this site? Is it the local people? Is it tourists? Why do they come here? Where do they come from? Well, that's pure geography. So we can bring in uh, a, a second subject into the thing very easily. The numbers, how many people see the angel? Well, the angel is situated right next to the A1, which is an extremely busy road into Newcastle. And it, it actually, one person sees it every second. So that means that 90,000 people see it every day. So 33 million people see it every year. It's one of the most viewed pieces of public art in the world. So there's some nice maths and stats that you can start to play around with there. Sounds. The A1 is obviously quite nearby, so that's quite interesting. But can you hear the A1 very much? I find it quite interesting that because of all the trees that surround it, it actually is quite a peaceful scene. And again, going back to the children I took up there, one of them said, I wonder what an angel sounds like. Which I thought was a really interesting question. So there's lots of things that you can bring in there, particularly music. Um, maybe the sound of the, the wind going across the wings um, produces a particular sound. Um, it's a very windy day in Newcastle at the moment. I wonder what it's sounding like up at the angel. It'd be very different to a very quiet day. Nature, what would you put down there? Well, it's a reclamation of an old mine. So nature has reclaimed this area. So there's lots to find in terms of different habitats. So your science curriculum can be addressed there very quickly by just going on the usual sorts of things of looking for different species that you can find at the different locations. Some of it is obviously mounded up to, for the angel to stand on, but round, the, round around the area, you will find um, quite um, a lot of regeneration that's occurred since the mine was reclaimed. Feelings. I, I, it's very interesting when you take people here, it does engender a feeling of awe and wonder. And the feelings change when you stand beneath it. I've had several people that said that, I don't want to go to the angel, it's a horrible, ugly thing. You take them up there and stand them beneath it, and suddenly it seems to have some kind of effect on them. I was related to the idea of it, it encloses its wings around you. But there's a whole series of English and drama ideas that you might start to bring up there. And, and actions. Was it inspired to build it here? Well, yes, in a way it was. It's an, an incredibly visible spot, as I say, for 90 million, 90,000 people see it every day. And it's become a bit of a symbol of the area. So there's a whole citizenship geography uh, a link there. What would you say is the symbol of your area? What's the symbol of the particular location that you live in? Um, certainly, this is one that's been adopted, certainly by Newcastle, even though it's actually built in Gateshead. Um, and how would you describe the angel? What words would you perhaps come up with? Um, several people have called it Rusty Rita. There have been some other names to it. 
But there's lots of opportunities there to go with the idea of English and poetry coming out based on that idea. So lots of ways in which you could um, look at the angel, lots of scaffolding that goes in there so you could write underneath those particular headings. And then you might go to another monument, another place, and you could use exactly the same headings. And then we can start to be comparative between different places, but, but having collected the same types of data. Okay, and, and Anthony, if you can go to the next one. So what's the value of the approach? Well, it's very interactive because it really engages and enthuses the users. Every group I've taken using this particular technique always sees something different. Now, I don't know about you, when I'm a teacher and I go to the same field work every year, that can be a problem in the sense that you, you know, you're going through the moat, you could end up going through the motions, but it's fresh for the children and it's certainly fresh for the teacher. The teacher gets it reinvigorated by what the children come up with when they see it. Different approaches have value for different learners. So this appeals to all of your learners because it addresses all of those intelligences, all of those senses of which some of us have got more well developed than others. It raises awareness and understanding of issues. Why was the angel built in that particular place? So it gives you a chance to go through some of the issues about a particular place and what's going on there. It certainly stimulates working collaboratively and cooperatively. So that's a really that really has a very positive action on your class. And as I say, it enables comparison between locations. I think for the users, and I've used this for all age groups, right through to adults, right down to, um, to, to some of the early years children. And it's a different process for developing a sense of place or understanding for each of those users. It's integrated, it's enjoyable, especially for field work. I think it is in field work that it really comes to the fore. But it's an opportunity for children to own their learning. They know what they want to record and they will record the things that intrigue them. That's a wonderful way in for you to then understand what makes them tick. So you can suddenly find a child that's very interested in a particular aspect, thanks to the, the, the framework. And the framework is repeatable. So after a while, children get used to using those eight, um, eight, those eight ways. It can be used in conjunction with a theme. For example, when the flooding occurred in Morpeth, I used it there. We, we investigated the floods in Morpeth using those eight ways. Um, we can put it into the climate crisis. We can put it into sustainability. We can use it in all sorts of different ways. And technology can readily be incorporated into the approach in under any of the headings. So it's very, very easy to use it as a framework for your field work that you can take with you wherever you go. Okay, thank you, Anthony. That's uh, that's great, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, it can look deceptively simple and straightforward eight ways thinking, but you've given us a brilliant example there with the Angel of North of the many, many ways uh, that uh, that that approach might take us in terms of how people might respond to a particular place. Uh, thank you, Anthony. We, we've now got some um, CPD uh, um, offers up on the screen. Uh, this is the Everyday Guide to Primary Geography series. All of them have lots of ideas for fieldwork, uh, mostly for very local fieldwork in the school grounds or very immediately around the school in them. Um, and was that the last slide, Anthony? Yeah, I thought so. So we've also got um, the In the Know series, which some of you will already know um, is about supporting teacher subject knowledge, whereas the CPD packs, which are on the previous slide, I think, uh, we've got, in fact, there are more of these now. We've had another another three published since these. But these offer support for any subject leader in school to lead um, CPD sessions for their colleagues of either during a, um, a staff meeting, perhaps just they, they all uh, offer opportunities for if you only get 15 minutes or if you get a full staff meeting of an hour or an hour and a quarter or if you're in the lucky position, uh, luxurious position even, of having a full day. So you can see uh, these, those were the first uh, seven, I think, to be published. There's another three now. Um, our next Jog Live uh, is on the 12th of June. Uh, it will be live, unlike this one, which, as you know, is being pre-recorded. And our focus on the 12th of June is decolonizing primary geography. And we're very pleased uh, that uh, one of our contributors on that session 
is Fran Martin, who's a previous president of the Geographical Association um, and uh, has a particular um, track record and interest in decolonizing the primary geography curriculum. So we're very much looking forward to that. And I would like to say that um, there is a person who um, was hoping to contribute today but couldn't actually come, Millie. Uh, we will uh, record Millie's uh, session with her slides and we will put them up on our YouTube uh, channel so you will be able to see uh, Millie's contribution as well. She is focusing on fieldwork for children with special educational needs. Uh, so on the screen in front of you now, you should be able to see our, our back catalogue, our archive of Geography Live sessions, uh, all running at about an hour, um, covering many, many different topics, um, fieldwork, early years, uh, using storybooks, um, um, some specifically aimed at subject leaders, um, such as the one on leading primary geography, some more aimed at teaching particular aspects of the curriculum, like teaching about places, um, or teaching about cold landscapes. So there's um, there's a, 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 an increasingly uh, large uh, archive of materials to explore there. Uh, they're free for anybody to, um, to go and explore. Uh, I do hope that you find them useful. Uh, so as I say, our next Jog Live event uh, will be on the 12th of um, June, and we look forward to seeing lots of you then. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again to the Jog Live team especially to Steve and Kate for presenting to us tonight. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>